Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining this maintainer track. So we're going to talk a little bit about next 35 minutes. KName, more than just serverless container. My name is Daniel Oh, I'm not more than happy to be here and moderating this session. I'm also CNCF ambassador. I've been a long time to like a uh, session tracking and then uh, CNCF ambassador and then like a track chair, some of the stuff of CNCF. So today we're going to have four great speaker from VMware, uh, Marcio and Ivan, and then from Red Hat and then Nana and Lance. Please welcome to our great speaker. Hello, everyone. Good to see so many faces here and as excited as we are about Knative. So today we are going to talk about more than just serverless containers, Knative. Why is Knative? And I'm going to give it to Evan. So, so um, Nana also pointed out that we should give you a little preview of what this is going to be because yes. there's kind of three different things that we've squeezed into one. Um, so I'm going to spend five or ten minutes explaining to you why you might want to use Knative. Then Lance is going to show you for five or ten minutes how you would use it and how easy it is. And then we're going to spend like the remaining time, which I guess is probably about 15 or 20 minutes, um, answering some questions, either questions that you've got or we've pre-prepared a list if everyone is so floored by our performance that they haven't thought of anything at all to ask. Yeah. And we don't gonna... expect that'll be the case. But... <laughs> we're going to start with the quintessential question is why is Knative? So, yeah, right. Evan, go ahead. Oh. Yeah, the next, next slide. You know, so the question is, why, why do you care? You know, why do we make Knative? And the really short answer is, um, so you want to deploy a service on Kubernetes. Look at all the stuff you have to learn on the left-hand side. If you're building a standard application using best practices, if you're building a 12-factor app, you better understand labels. You better understand services and deployments and pods and containers and ingresses, and you probably want a horizontal pod autoscaler, and maybe there's a couple other resources in there that we haven't talked about um, that you're gonna need to understand as a developer. What is, in learning those, you have to push something else out of your brain. That's probably your business domain concepts, the stuff that gives you value. So how can, for these common cases, we make it simple and easy to run a web application and to build um, event-driven applications because if you go to your Kubernetes toolbox and you're like, where's the event-driven stuff? The answer is it's not in that box. And so Knative gives you that box as well. So let's talk a little bit about how serving works under the hood to give you basically a magical experience. Um, so if your container speaks HTTP, you can get all these benefits, but you can write less YAML than normal Kubernetes. Um, and if you're wondering how this works under the covers, um, we work with a variety of different HTTP routers. Um, Istio Contour, we have our own one that people wrote to be a really lightweight one that works with Knative. Um, and the Gateway API, we've got decent coverage there as well. Um, so you can swap in whichever HTTP router you want. And then when a request comes in, if there's not enough instances running, we will route requests to the activator, which will basically say, oh, wait just a minute. I'm not going to answer this HTTP request yet. And it'll turn around real fast. And it'll run to the autoscaler and tell the autoscaler, hey, we need more capacity. And the autoscaler will tell the API server, please increase the number of pods. And then a pod will come up. And the activator has been sitting there with his request in his hand. And he's like, ah, oh, yes, I can send this guy over here. And then we'll route the request there. And that's what you would call a cold start in the serverless world. And that can happen when you're scaling up from zero. It can also happen if you get a burst of, you know, 2,000 requests all at once, you know, and you were scaled to five instances. Maybe five instances isn't enough for 2,000 requests. So you can either dump all that load on those instances, or you can pause some of those requests and go quick, get some more capacity. And it may be a better choice for your end users to pause things for a little bit, get that extra capacity. Some of the requests, you know, flow through on your active ones in the meantime but we'll limit the number of requests in flight to a user container. That proxy in there is aware of how much, how many concurrent requests you think your container can handle. And then we scale based on that concurrency. Um, you also get stuff like 
automatic TLS and automatic URL provisioning because you know this is not the 90s and this stuff should be easy. We've got <laughs> tools for it. Next slide. So one more. So we're going to talk about eventing as well. Um, I do interstitials, but then I skip over them, I guess. Um, so you want to be able to build event-driven applications too. This is a great way to take existing applications and extend them. Um, there's a pattern that we identified a couple years back that we call publishing your internal monologue. So this is a great way to take an existing application that's maybe, um, I call it an heirloom app. You know, you've had it for quite a while, but it's important to you. Maybe it makes half your revenue. Um, maybe it's also written in a language that's hard to hire for. Um, maybe it's hard to extend for other reasons, infra infrastructurally or architecturally. How can you take those events out of your application you know, hey, I added this thing to a cart. I added this other thing to a shopping cart. The shopping cart monolith is huge and enormous. What if I publish all those things going into the cart into an event broker which can route, you know, all these different events to the people who are interested in them? And they can call back into my API and be like, hey, I saw that you, this person got these three products in their, you know, in their shopping cart. Let's add a coupon. But now you didn't have to write that in your monolith. You could write it in a little function on the side. Um, so, or maybe you want to incorporate infrastructure events, you know, GitHub pull requests or Slack messages or, you know, Twilio. Um, you know, you, you want to get text message from customers and you want to build that in a microservice way where you don't have to re rebuild the integration with Twilio into every single thing that wants to do messaging. Hey, we got this text from a customer. Maybe you know that triggers three or four different things, um, and they can all trigger independently. And event-driven architectures give you tools for that. And again, just like we could plug in a lot of different HTTP routing implementations, we can plug in a lot of different um, message routing or message persistence implementations, Kafka, Nats, um, RabbitMQ, and so forth. And so you can choose that based on configuration rather than writing a bunch of code that's Kafka specific and then you discover that there's something about Kafka that doesn't work for you, like maybe you get head of line stalling or something like that and you want to switch to a different implementation. It'd be really nice if that was like 10 lines of YAML and not like, oh, well, we need to build a new ORM layer based off of RabbitMQ instead. Um, and maybe in two different languages because we're polyglot. 10 lines of YAML sounds real good in exchange. Um, so the last piece that's a big, go ahead, one more. Um, a big piece of Knative is, I called it serverless. Everyone thinks of serverless as functions as a service. AWS Lambda popularized this idea. But basically, you can take just a little bit of code, and Lance will show you this later, and you can write it in your regular language, and then we'll wrap an HTTP server around it and we'll turn it into a container, and we'll put it up on Knative, and you just think about your business logic in there. We were talking earlier about the MetaController thing. Lance only had to think about the resources that MetaController did. Didn't have to think about, oh, how do I pick a, a HTTP stack? How do I make sure that monitoring's in there? How do I make sure that all these other things? We build that logic into the function framework, and then we have function frameworks for, you know, Quarkus, and Spring Boot, and Python, and Java, and, or, Java, um, Python and Go and TypeScript and Node and so forth. Um, and so you can just take one of these off the shelf and start building containers <laughs> without having to think about it. And we've got all the expertise of building containers in there. So um, you get good, strong, minimal containers and you don't have to write like a two-stage Docker file for your Node.js stuff. And I'm sure that everyone's shedding tears at this point thinking about, oh, but I don't get to write those Docker files anymore. You know, I don't get to write a lot of YAML. Yeah, sometimes Kubernetes is not all about YAML. And so now Lance is going to put things together with the demo, and Marisha is going to tell you more about what's going on. Yeah, so uh, there was a lightning talk yesterday. I don't know if anybody of you caught it, and Lance is going to do the demo of that exact lightning talk today. So Lance and Marisha, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, they wouldn't let me do the actual demo during the lightning talk, I guess, because there's, you know, uh, demos are 
notoriously dangerous. <laughs> but you Sometimes prepared they go for overtime. it, right? Yeah, so I you prepared. should do I pre it. I prepared for it. Okay, um, so I want to talk a little bit about what I'm going to build first, and then, um, and then I'll do it. Uh, so uh, basically, um, I'm going to create a little uh, translation bot uh, that ha uses a Twitter uh, search camlet from CamelK as an event source. Uh, it takes Twitter, uh, it takes tweets um, from a, the Twitter search API, converts those into cloud events, sends them all directly to the Knative event broker. Uh, and the event broker has a couple of triggers attached to it. One of them uh, filters on the type of events that are coming from the Twitter search camlet uh, and sends those directly to the translation function. The translation function will respond with a cloud event directly back to the broker. And then the broker will send that new event onto a viewer function, which isn't really doing much, just printing it to the screen, printing the cloud event to the screen so that we can see it worked. And hopefully it will. So let's see. Um, <laughs> okay, so the first thing I want to do is show you a little bit about um, what these... Do I have this? So we've got a translate function here. Uh, really basic, really simple. Uh, this is all of it. You can see it's about less than 40 lines of code. Um, it has a, a single function in here, some defaults. Um, the first thing it does is it receives a cloud event as part of its invocation. Uh, that cloud event has the tweet attached to it in the data field. Uh, and then if the data, uh, or sorry, if the tweet is in English, we just return a new cloud event uh, with these defaults with a new cloud event type and source uh, with the text of the tweet itself. Um, if the tweet is not in English, then we call the Google Translate um, API. Uh, translating that, returning the result of that translation as the data field for the new cloud event. Uh, and the original text um, is just included as uh, another field on the data. <coughs> can Excuse I mention, me, can I mention something there? Yeah, yeah, please. So Lance is showing a function that he created with a command line tool that it's called func. And you can run a command. I don't know if are you going to create a new function. Uh, I'm not going to create okay, it. Okay, no. good stuff. So basically, he used a command line tool uh, that it's func create. And it allows you to choose the language that you want to use in order to create that function. And it will scaffold a function for you in the specified language. You can use some uh, you know, uh, repositories to bring some templates where you can just start off from a scaffolding function in the language of your choice that already has some dependencies in it and just bring all the stuff that, you know, that your company wants to, uh, for you to use to interact with other systems. So he's showing already a function that it's already been built and created and coded, right? Yeah. Uh, so, um, it, actually, I'll just, um, if I were to create this function from scratch, I'd do Great. func create uh, minus L node minus T cloud events and give it a name. Uh, L is the language runtime, T is the type of function that we want. It's either cloud events or HTTP by default. Um, but we've already done that. I've already built it and pushed it up to a registry because that takes time and I don't trust the network here. So, I'm just going to do func deploy uh, and tell it, uh, don't build it, don't push it. And, uh, yeah, I'm not in the right directory. Translate, func deploy. And it'll take just a second. And I can go back over here to my IDE. Uh, and well, I should... When you're switching, let me just mention that basically what that func deploy is doing is using a project that's called Cloud Native Build Packs to transform the source code of the function into a container image. He's not pushing that container image right now, but he already did that before, and Funk will take care of all of that for you, right? So if you are logged into a container registry, when you run Funk deploy, it's going to build the container image, publish it into a registry, and then deploy to the cluster that it's configured to deploy. Right. Very good. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then we have a viewer function. Um, and let me go back here to my IDE and show you that. The viewer function is even simpler than the translate function. This one is written in Go, uh, and this is all of it. It's less than 15 lines of code. Now, of course, it's not really doing anything very interesting. Can I make this bigger so you can see it? Um, it's not really doing a whole lot that's interesting. It's just printing out the cloud event to uh, the console so that we can see that everything worked. So I'll go build this. Do you want to show the funk YAML as well? Maybe. <laughs> we'll wait. After, good. after. <laughs> after. So, quick, quick note there as well. So he also did, like, did func create with Go in this case for creating that other function. 
And also now he's also using build packs to transform, again, now a function that it's reading in Go into a container image. The nice thing about using build packs is that you can create build packs to detect what language are you using and then the transformation of that code into a container image, no matter, again, the language that you're using. It's pretty cool because it will allow platform teams, for example, to curate how that process works. So you can include some governance about how you transform source code to container images that your company might require to use certain you know, base layers and different containers and validate security and all that stuff. Yeah, and you can see actually down here, I'm, I'm watching the pods of this uh, as I deploy things. And you can see that these functions are spinning up, but then there's no traffic on my cluster. So you can see that they've already terminated as we've been talking. All right, the other piece of the puzzle is that Twitter search camlet. Um, it's just, uh, it, it's from the Camel K project. It's just a bunch of YAML. I've got at the top of that, in that file, all of my private keys. So I'm not gonna, <laughs> not gonna show that right now. Uh, <laughs> just know that if you have your keys uh, and a search term, really all you have to do is fill those, fill the blanks in in the YAML file and then use kubectl apply um, if you use the word kubectl. Again, quick note around that, like, so he configured a, a component goes against the, the Twitter APIs, fetch tweets, transform those into cloud events, and then it routes those cloud events into the functions that he's deploying, right? And these components are taking care of doing kind of like all the routing and moving and transforming tweets into cloud events. And you can easily do that with Camlet in this case, right? Like, pretty easy. Configure the credentials and it works. Oh, okay. So the demo gods hit me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my cluster doesn't have Camel K installed. Let's see if I can Ooh. do that real quick. <laughs> let's do it. Let's do it. Show show all your credentials and yeah. API keys. <laughs> and, and another thing about functions is that it, we provide local developer experience through CLI. You can use it through IDI. We have extensions in uh, VS Code and IntelliJ. And you can build it on cluster itself. So you don't need to do it on your local. But all of those things, you're covered. All right. You, um, that looks like it might take a little while. Yeah, this is going to take a little <laughs> while. And I was all braggy about this working in five <laughs> minutes. Um, OK, well, um, that you saw me deploy a function. You saw me uh, deploy two functions, actually. Um, our functions generally, out of the box, um, will uh, just echo what the input that they receive. So let me do one more thing and just create another function and see if we can use the func invoke command to, to yeah. see if it works. OK, so this I'll just do func create. Uh, and we'll do the, the hello. And then I can do func deploy. Oh, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. You need to push that one, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, push it, push it. Oh. OK, so this is going to take some time. So you, that's you talk a little bit. Yeah, I think I just wanted to say <laughs> something about that. So we are using func create to create functions. We are using func deploy to deploy functions into a Kubernetes cluster. But it's also worth mentioning that we have func run that will actually start the container locally. So it will build the container and it will start the container locally in case that you want to interact with it. As Nina mentioned as well. I was going to say that, yeah. and if you want to test it, we have an invoke functionality, which I think Lance is going to show us. Like yeah, I mean, I can it. do that by um, actually just going to, uh, let me split this screen. You can use the viewer to invoke yeah, the viewer, I right? Yeah, I think I can just do the viewer. So all those local there. development and the local testing you can do of your function for your faster iterations, right? So. And to be clear, these Knative functions are locally building a container and then creating a Knative service which you can also, like any container works there, these happen to work well, but you can find other ones that work well too. So, mm -hmm. um, and you'll see that each service tells you, you know, he's running the KN service, list all my services, and they all will tell you what their address is so yep. that you can go and reach them. I mean, in this case, you have to be on his machine to reach them because that looks like a localhost address. Okay, so we've got a viewer function running from the, the directory of that function project. I can run func invoke, uh, and we can see in the bottom that the, uh, the uh, function was spun up, and then it received the response. Let's see, func invoke minus v. There we go. It received the response, uh, hello world. It's basically sending hello world just to test that the function 
works. So when I do Funk Invoke, uh, the Funk CLI is creating a cloud event, just a synthetic event that it sends directly to the function on the cluster if it happens to be running on the cluster. If it's not running on the cluster, you can run your functions locally. Uh, so I could run, uh, uh, I could do Funk Run here uh, to run and build false. And it will build anyway. <laughs> Again, either you can use your, the language tools that you're using. Let's say, for example, you're using Quarkus or Spring Boot. You can use Maven tools to do the testing. But we also provide this functionality of Funk Run. This is going to create a container and test the container on your machine so you don't have that works on my machine. <laughs> <laughs> and something that I wanted to add to that is that the commands that we are showing here to interact, to create, and deploy functions are interesting in the, in the sense that you don't actually need to write, again, any Jammer file or any Docker file, like as Evan mentioned. But also, it provides you, you know, a programming model based on functions. So when, you're, like, when you give these tools to developers, they only need to focus on building very, very focused functions, and you know, the tool will take care of the rest. And and they may need registry auth and a cube config. Something else, yeah. But you know, if you tell them, put this file here and put this file there, they don't need to actually understand what a registry is or how Kubernetes just, works. Yeah, yeah. They just say, here's my function, please deploy it. And then they get a URL and you know, they can call invoke and stuff like that without having to learn all that stuff. And then it's there yeah. and they can learn it later when it's you know, convenient, when they need it to debug. But it's not like, oh, well the first thing you need to do is climb the wall that's this tall. And after that, <laughs> you know, you're in the garden and it's wonderful. Maybe we should put a gate there. <laughs> Um, Evan, I'm going to take your advice and, and just show a little bit of the func.yaml file. Yeah. These are some of the innards, uh, uh, you know, that the func CLI uses. Um, and th there's some stuff in here that's kind of interesting that maybe I'll share with you. Uh, first of all, uh, we, you know, keep a record of what the image is and, in fact, what the SHA is for the image that's currently deployed. So we know if you've changed your source code in any way, we can build uh, and push a new um, uh, image directly. We keep a record of what uh, the invocation format is, whether it's just simple HTTP or cloud event. Um, you can also do things like add environment variables uh, and labels and annotations directly to your function using the func CLI. Um, and you can. And so that'll rewrite this file, and you don't have to actually read the YAML. You can just. Yeah, yeah. CLI actually, and... let's let me let me show you this. I can do um, func config env's add. And um, it'll ask me if I want an environment variable, and I want to add a new one, and I'll just give it a specified value. We'll say it's foo and bar. And then when I go back to my func.yaml, I should, I'm in the wrong directory. Let's look at it in VI. Hmm. There we go. So you don't, you don't have to directly manipulate the YAML file yourself. But you can if you want to. You can. You can if you want to, yeah. If you want to mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> then debug it. Yeah. Uh, I only okay, get tabs so, in there half the time, so you know. Sorry? Mostly, I, I only get tabs in there half the time, so I'm, I'm all good. Right. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the demo gods bit us a little bit, but I hope that um, helped you get a sense of, of the function in CLI and how that works and how it ties all of the pieces of Knative together in some way, right? We use cloud events in the functions. We uh, interact directly with the Knative services, creating services from this function code, and then, you know, of course, uh, deal with brokers and triggers and everything else. To, to mention that we have a couple of uh, examples, and I know that Red Hat and, and folks here at VMware, we are building different examples of like more like event-based applications using functions, using Kennedy serving, and all that stuff. So if you're interested in that, feel free to, to reach out and we can share. Yeah, and we have a slide we'll share about how to reach us and how to join the community in as well. But I think with this, we can oh, one more. Uh, open the floor for questions. <laughs> oh. That QR code? Yeah. We didn't get it? <laughs> I didn't yeah. get it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I guess we have, what, about 10 more minutes? Should we yeah. open it up for questions? Yeah, yeah. sounds good. Questions? Yeah, I can go. I can go. Oh. <laughs> Too fast. Oh, thank you. Um, I saw that the CLI builds uh, an image for you. 
I was wondering if I can set the target for other architectures. So probably you build in AMD, and I want to run my workloads on ARM, for instance. So um, I would be able to configure that. I don't know how you configured that, but I know that build packs can build multi-architecture images, or presumably for an architecture that's not the one that you're on. Yes, it's it a wrapper around build packs. It uses build packs, yeah. Is everything that's available on CLI is also available through API because we currently integrate Knative in our platform. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a developer build platform. Um, yeah. Yes. I, I suspect that there's some stuff available through the API that may not be exposed on the CLI, but there's nothing that's the opposite way. Yeah, we're using the API. <laughs> Are there known scaling limits? Oh, absolutely. How many how many um, uh, transactions per second or operations per second? Uh, so those limits are pretty high when we've tested them because in the, in the case where throughput becomes high, we actually take the activator completely out of the path. And so it looks like your requests come in to you know, your contour or your SEO or whatever, and they go to a pool of backends, which looks like Kubernetes in general, the way you deploy it. And so, um, I don't have specific scalability numbers, but I would guess that you know, 20,000 requests per second on an appropriately sized cluster would work. Um, you can obviously, depending on your Kubernetes cluster, like there's limits to how big your Kubernetes cluster can be. Um, but there's nothing, you know, we haven't seen substantial um, scalability limits in terms of a single service throughput. Um, I know the IBM folks gave a really good talk about accommodating um, many, many tenants on one cluster for IBM Code Engine. So they run open source Knative with Istio in mesh mode. And there are, there's a bunch of tuning that they described um, in some detail on Monday around tuning the Istio mesh so that it doesn't get angry with you. Service meshes are subtle and quick to anger, apparently. Yeah. Like wizards. Uh, in terms of cost effectiveness, if you compare it with the clouds itself, uh, what is the threshold after which Knative makes sense versus just using one of the cloud providers? Because there are a certain number of free uh, triggers that I allow. Do you, do you want me to take this? Or? Yeah. Um, so I think that's a really hard question to answer um, because there's so many different variables. But a couple thoughts that I would give you for why I think Knative is a promising place. Um, you've got the strength of Kubernetes underneath. So if you want to do GPU models with acceleration, you can get that pretty easily with Knative. You just say request GPU one. Um, on the various cloud providers, that can be hard to get access to. Um, similarly, like your size of a pod could be enormous if that was the right thing for you. So there's a bunch of capabilities that are different between the two. Um, and also, like, costs it depends on how well you utilize your cluster, yeah. because Knative is going to run on a cluster, whereas the cloud provider is going to use magic. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I also like to tell people that you're one acquisition away from being multi-cloud. But if it is your own cluster, <laughs> but if it is your own cluster and you are looking for cost effectiveness, then I think that's immediate, right? If you are running through Knative services, you are only using your resources when they are in action. The, there is a small overhead for that, the Knative, Knative controllers and potentially the activator. Absolutely. But yeah. um, overall, that is fairly small. If you are actually scaling multiple things so that they fill in each other's valleys, then you'll tend to win from that. Yes. Um, there's also just a ease of mind. I don't have to think about and tweak this stuff that pays for it in terms of developer time spent on business Figuring problems out, rather yeah. than on playing with Kubernetes. So that was one of my curated questions as well, that why <laughs> do I use Knative if some resources are still running, right? So, yeah. so thank you for answering that already. Uh, so. Uh, uh, this question is on integration. You okay. mentioned like two integration, the cloud events-based integration, the HTTP integration also. What are the other integrations that kind of uh, 
come out of the box, if I call that way, right? And the second question is like, you know, if the HTTP integration, what, how much plumbing is taking care of, for example, HTTP connection pooling, right? Do I have to worry about it, or is it like, you know, baked into some, you know, so, boilerplate code or whatever? Thank you. So I feel like I can answer the second question about the connection pooling um, with a little bit of description of what's going on there. So because the HTTP proxy and the activator are both, um, both level seven aware things, they will connection pool between them and all the way to that Q proxy sidecar. And then you've got connections over localhost and you can spin up connections over localhost and send throughput over localhost. It's not free, but it's darn near free. Um, so in terms of connection stuff, we'll wire all the hard parts and then you get the easy part of, you know, oh, I just close the connection every time and it's fine. Or, you know, I implement pipelining and because my library does it and I didn't think about turning it off. Um, okay. In terms of integrations, um, Knative is really focused on having a couple key APIs, cloud events for eventing, in particular cloud events over HTTP post. So it's actually, it's HTTP underneath for all of it. Um, and then Knative Eventing has all of these event sources like the Camel universe and some things that they've built, that we've built on our own um, that take things from the outside world and turn them into cloud events that you get posted. And, so. Yeah, and the nice thing about that is that you can just rely on HTTP for connecting to other systems, so you don't need libraries to, for example, send messages or you know, more like event-based systems. So you can just rely on HTTP, let developers use HTTP for all the communications, and it makes it like a little bit easier for developers to start with, at least. And we support most of the flavors of HTTP. I'm not sure that we've got HTTP 3 yet, but we support gRPC, um, WebSockets, yep. HTTP 2. Uh, let's say your lookup or your function involves doing a lookup against a relational database or something that in similarly involves uh, It's not scalable. Tech. Okay. <laughs> well, no, I mean, your, yeah. your problem is less that it's expensive tech and more that um, like a MySQL database has connection limits, for example. And if I start up 700 pods against a database that supports 500 connections, I'm going to have 200 sad pods, right? Uh, to some extent, yes, but even if, you, if you're running in a function system like Lambda, which I'm mm -hmm. familiar with, you're going to hit that faster just because everything is creating a new connection for every single invocation. So I'm wondering if you have any. So there's two features of Knative that can help you avoid that. Um, one is because we're HTTP native, um, we have a connection concurrency bound that you can set on the containers, and you can set that higher than one. So you can say, I handle 20 connections at a time, and then I have you know, one connection pooled, like connection to MySQL, for those 20 requests in flight. Because Lambda's connection concurren um, concurrency is effectively one always. Um, you can't get as effective pooling. The other thing is that there are tuning knobs, so you can say max number of instances is something, and then after that, when you cross it, you get errors. But you were gonna get errors anyway, and maybe they're cheaper errors. Mm -hmm. So, so I'll say that for every request, there is not another function that's going to handle it, right? The one function that has been deployed in the container is going to help handle those concurrent requests that the knob that you have set. So after that, you say up 75% later, I want more, so then there will be more. So. Yeah, I mean, we did see the function spin down when I was watching the, the pods, uh, but, but, the, the, but they will, like Nana just said, they, they'll handle multiple requests. If you've got lots of requests coming in. It's not spinning up a new function for every request. It's spinning up a new pod based on the scaling need, but that each pod handles ma many incoming requests. Can handle. Are there spin up and tear down? Uh, so we, we do a few things to manage the life cycle for you so you don't have to think about it. So when we determine that we should spin down a pod because you know, let's say you've got 500 requests worth of capacity, you know, concurrent requests worth of capacity, and you've got your load of 200. There's this big gap in between. We will, um, we will start the termination um, and use termination grace period. I will, yeah. Um, we'll start the termination grace period in our own thing, and we will not let new connections in, but we'll t close out the existing ones smoothly. So you don't have to think about that type of thing. Um, 
And so we've got one more question back here, it looks like. Yeah, this is not a question. It's just an add-on to what Evan said about the cost infliction point. So I think for a single cluster, for cost infliction point with Knative, you can consume cheaper compute shapes like ARM devices and stuff like that in spot instances, which will be much more economical than Lambda functions. And uh, to expand upon what he talked about multi-cloud, with Knative, you can consume the cheapest compute across multiple cloud providers in a federated Kubernetes cluster environment, as opposed to being tied down to a single cloud vendor. So the, the, those are the two cost plays I would think would be very interesting with Knative. Nope. I think we are at the time. So um, I'm happy to continue the conversation with folks. With outside, we can take the yeah, conversation the outside. Hallway. And this is how you can get in touch with us. All the questions, all the concerns, and if you just want to come and say hi. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you everyone. And I, I have a few stickers, and they have more stickers downstairs. I believe it's